Good afternoon and welcome to today's electronic design webcast. Our topic today is build smarter devices with the world's smallest ARM Cortex M4 with FPU microcontroller sponsored by DigiKey and Maxim Integrated. I'm Chris D. Martino with Informus Design Engineering Sourcing Group. To begin, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First of all, if you have any technical difficulties during today's session, simply hit F5 to refresh your webcast console. If you need assistance in solving common issues, please click on the yellow help icon below the slides. Additionally, we welcome your questions during today's event. We will answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation, but please feel free to send in your questions at any time. To do so, simply, simply type your questions into the question window on the side of your screen and hit the submit button. Also, please be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the electronic design website within the next week. You will be notified by email when the archive is available. You may also download a PDF copy of the slides by clicking the green folder icon in the toolbar beneath the slides. Now let's meet today's speakers. Ben Smith is a principal member of technical staff software at Maxim Integrated and has been charged with overseeing product definitions for systems on chips based on customer requirements and current anticipated current and anticipated technological capabilities at the company since 2003. Prior to this, he worked as an engineering manager at Metro Optics. He received a BSDE and a Bachelor of Science in Computer Engineering from the University of Missouri Rolla. Chris Artis is an executive director in the Micro Security and Software Business Unit at Maxim Integrated. He began his career with Maxim as a software engineer and holds two U.S. patents. In his current role, he is responsible for bringing his business unit's products to the broad market, providing marketing, sales support, and product management for microcontroller and security products. He has a BS in computer science from the University of Texas at Austin. Now let me turn things over to our presenters. Ben and Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chris. This is Chris Artis in uh, Maxim's Micro Security and Software Group, and I'm going to kick off today's presentation just by talking a little bit first about uh, what you might think about doing with the world's smallest Cortex M4F microcontroller. So let me start with some seemingly stupid statements. First of all, let's you know, let's agree that smaller is generally better. Uh, we all remember old cell phones being bricks, and we tend to like our cell phones today much better. There's a lot of good reasons why there's a drive for smaller devices. When you consider the medical industry, smaller monitoring devices are allowing people to leave the hospital earlier to be uh, without constant care because they can be constantly monitored because that data can get to their doctors just as efficiently as if they were in the hospital bed. Uh, smaller optical transceiver modules are allowing more data to actually flow through data centers and make those spaces more efficient. And smaller earphones and headphones are transforming our, our mobile experience. Uh, we've gone from being a, a tethered uh, headphone society to, to a society where we don't have to let those wires get in the way of us anymore. And we're starting to see more sensors get designed into those headphones. So simple statement number one, smaller is better. Simple statement number two, lower power is also better. Again, this is something we can all agree with. Um, lower power allows things like activity watches to support more analytics or longer run times, allows them to run the entire length of a marathon, or if you're more like me, it allows you to monitor your sleep all night um, without, dying, um, without the battery dying on you. Um, lower power is also important in plenty of other applications like a, uh, like a smart door lock. Uh, there, I found a fantastic picture of a poor guy who had to carry around a USB charger when he got locked out of his door because the power ran out. Another example of where you don't really want power to run out in your, in your, uh, uh, in your devices. Uh, in addition, low power sensors, not just on the farm but really everywhere, will require less servicing and replacement. When you we think about the Internet of Things and think about wide networks of sensors being deployed, 
having a shorter life cycle because of battery replacement time increases the investment, increases the costs, and throws any kind of return on investment calculation out of whack. So lower power is definitely better for any kind of widely deployed sensor. And I think we can all agree that cost is important as well. Uh, in some devices, it causes just a barrier to adoption, things like personal safety monitors for, uh, for young children or for the elderly. Uh, cost can be a barrier to those things actually being used. There are devices that are very helpful that can, that can save lives or, or be great convenience, but if the cost is too high, they won't do anybody any good. Uh, in some cases, cost is, matters because of the volume. If you want a sensor on every single window or door, the cost can't be too much or consumers won't, won't go for it. And some devices want to be thrown away, things like cold chain monitors uh, going into this package of shrimp. Um, if the cost is too high for those, it, it makes it more difficult for, uh, for shipping companies to monitor the conditions of goods that get shipped, which is all very useful data. You want to know if the shrimp got too hot when they're uh, on the boat or on the plane or whatever they were doing. Um, and so it's very important to have that data, but not if the cost is too high. So we've got these things that we all agree are, are, are important, size, power, and cost, but they actually work against some of the other trends that we have going on. Devices definitely want to get smarter. Um, phones used to do just be for listening and talking. Now they monitor our health. Now they run the apps. Now they do so many more things. Um, even though things are getting smaller, they're actually adding functionality. Let's take another example they might not be thinking of, the uh, um, fall sensors that an elderly person might wear uh, are starting to integrate more sensors for health tracking, for location tracking. They're starting to integrate more functionality, all without increasing size, decreasing battery life, all those things. So you have the desire for staying small and low power uh, fighting against the desire for more integration, more functionality. Uh, devices are also looking to add more sensors as well. You think about uh, you think about watches that now have become smart. They're constantly adding more functionality as well, especially uh, for health sensors for doing additional monitoring of us. It risk is a fantastic location. It's very non-invasive for monitoring health conditions. Um, and so more and more devices need more sensors. There's probably a powerful microprocessor running in that watch you see there in the picture, but is that really the right choice to actually monitor a heart rate sensor or an ECG sensor or something like that? Similarly, if we think about the cold chain monitor uh, example again, you can think about other, uh, other things you'd like to sense, vibration, did the package get broken or dropped while I was in transit? humidity, air quality, was exposed to too much light. So you start to think about other sensors that will provide us valuable data for understanding what exactly happened to that container of shrimp uh, while it was in transit. So again, we want these things to stay small, low power, and last a long time, but they need to do more. And they need to do more oftentimes without actually increasing the amount of space available. And a medical patch that grows too big is going to be uh, no better than the halter you have to wear at the hospital. In order to really uh, monitor patients' conditions, that they, they need to be invisible and they need to disappear. So we have a balancing act here that we have to uh, maintain. How do we balance the constraints with the market demands? Constraints like low power and small size and affordability uh, with the desire for more processing and more sensors. If you look at landscape of products available today that kind of fit the small processor uh, requirement, you see the memory sizes and the processors here, mostly 8-bit, some Cortex-M0 processors, and nothing above 32 kilobytes of flash. 32 kilobytes is enough to run a simple application but not provide a lot of analysis or insights and probably not monitor a whole bunch of sensors. So what's the designer to do? So here we introduce the MAX 32660. This is the world's smallest Cortex M4F microcontroller. Uh, at 1.6 millimeters, it's, uh, it's nearly as small as every single micro you saw on the previous page, but with far more functionality. It has 256 kilobytes of flash, up to 96 kilobytes of SRAM, a uh, handful of I.O. with standard interfaces like SPI and I2C and UART and a real-time clock. 
It's also extremely low power, and so it's very usable for any kind of widely deployed sensor network or, or sensor uh, fusion hub. So you can see the size is available there in the wafer level package or two or a couple of TQFN options. Even in TQFN, this is a very small um, size effective solution. So how does this product uh, match up against these constraints and market demands? Well, it's low power. It's, it can be down to 45 microwatt per megahertz. It's obviously very small. It went 1.6 millimeters on the side. Um, and it can be affordable. It can be competitive when, with any similar or close to similar um, memory size microcontroller. It provides a lot more ho processing horsepower than anything available on the market today in that kind of a size constraint. Uh, the 96 megahertz processor, the Cortex M4F has DSP and floating point uh, hardware acceleration to support uh, uh, lots of algorithms. And in addition, because it's uh, it's a fast processor with that DSP and floating point extension, uh, it's great for being a sensor hub. It can bolt on to multiple sensors on the outside and actually do something intelligent with that data rather than spewing raw data upstream unprocessed. So if we go back to that table we showed earlier with the various devices, you can see the 32660 all the way out there at the right is nearly the smallest device there. But when you consider everything else it brings in terms of being able to run algorithms, having a very high performance processor, and having plenty of flash and SRAM, it's really the most powerful solution for adding intelligence into a wide range of devices. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Ben Smith, who will take you through more technical details on the MAX 32660. Ben? Oh, great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and uh, everybody, thanks for attending. Uh, I think we're going to have some fun today. Um, I want to talk about the, the 660 and, and start out by giving you the 1,000-foot uh, the view. Um, to start out, <laughs> Chris is right. This is one tiny chip. And I'll give you a little bit of history just to put this in perspective. Typically, we'll, uh, we'll build things in a TQFP. Uh, the thing about a TQFP is that it's mostly plastic and just a little bit of silicon. Um, the uh, MAX32620 TQFP, which is kind of the previous uh, generation of uh, ARM Cortex M4 uh, micros that we offered, was 16 millimeters on a side. Uh, and we thought that was pretty good at the time. Uh, obviously, uh, obviously, we got to do better than that, though. Uh, so we came down to ball grid arrays. The MAX 32600 is a, uh, is a uh, Cortex M3 part with, uh, with a lot of analog front end, and so it needed a lot of connections. Uh, it was 12 millimeters on a side, and uh, we're, we're getting smaller. We're not quite there. The uh, 625 was our, our previous small part, and in a TQFN, we could get down to about an 8 millimeter package. And our um, 630, which is uh, which is kind of a fully featured part in a uh, WLP package, could get us down to uh, four millimeters. This part is 1.6 millimeters on a side, so that means it's really a tiny part, and you can frankly fit this pretty much anywhere you want to go. Not just tiny; uh, it's fast, uh, 96 megahertz uh, top speed. Uh, with a uh, floating point unit and uh, support for single instruction, multiple data uh, DSP instructions. Uh, so you can actually do a lot of signal processing and, uh, and a lot of sensor processing in this part. Um, it's fairly inexpensive, uh, under a dollar in quantity, uh, so this is certainly not going to break the bank, and it's, it's really suitable for, for applications where you're doing a, a lot of, um, you need a, a lot of processing horsepower, but you really don't need to add a lot of cost to the bill of materials. Um, it's fairly frugal in terms of power. Uh, Chris mentioned this, 45 uh, microwatts per megahertz. Uh, it does have a built-in LDO. If you use the built-in LDO, you're going to uh, spend a little bit more. It's going to come up to about 81 or so microwatts per megahertz. Retention power, though, is just 1.8 microwatts. So if you shut down the, the microcontroller itself but, but retain the memory, uh, you're only going to spend about 1.8 microwatts to, to keep the memory alive. It's a flexible part. Uh, if, you use the, um, if you use the wafer level package, uh, you're going to get 10 GPIO pins. If you use the TQFN package, you're going to get 14 uh, GPIO pins. 
All these pins are assignable with up to three alternate functions, and we're going to go into some detail on that uh, as, we, uh, as we proceed. Uh, then finally, uh, it's a roomy part. Uh, you get 256 k bytes of flash, 96 k bytes of, of SRAM. Uh, so the upshot is that this is, a, uh, this is a, a part in a small package, but it sure doesn't behave like a small microcontroller. Uh, in a nutshell, it's little, it's cheap, it's really fast, and it uh, just sips power. So we think we're going to see a lot of application for the uh, 62, uh, the 32660 in, uh, in a lot of various areas. Let's drill down first into those bumps and pins and see, uh, see what that all means. You get two package options, really three, but, but I'm going to highlight two uh, today. The 16 bump WLP and the 20 pin TQFN. There's also a 24 pin TQFN that's actually a little smaller than the 20 pin. Um, but uh, th we're going to drill down into these package options. Whichever one you choose, six of these pins belong to me. Uh, they're, they're there to provide power, to provide clock and, and reset. We'll take a look first uh, at the power pins. Uh, there are three power pins, uh, VDD and VSS, so your power and ground, but also a vCore pin. And here's how they work. If you're trying to get to the lowest cost, uh, you're going to use the internal LDO, and it looks like this. Hook up the battery to VDD. Uh, VDD is going to supply the I.O. ring, so we don't have a separate pin for, for the I.O. supply. VDD is the I.O. supply. We have an internal uh, low dropout linear regulator uh, that provides power for the core uh, and for all the digital circuitry. There's a V-core pin, and in this lowest cost power scheme, all you do is just hook up a capacitor to V-core, and uh, that filters V-core and provides, um, uh, just provides some continuity for that uh, power rail. So that's one power scheme. Now there's a second power scheme that you can use where, uh, where basically you provide both VDD and vCore, typically you're going to use an external PMIC for that kind of um, for that kind of application. So you'd be driving power into VDD and into vCore and disable the internal LDO. That gets you a much higher efficiency because you don't have the the losses incurred uh, in the low dropout regulator. Um, it does involve a little bit more cost, and PMIX certainly aren't, aren't cheap or aren't free, but they can be fairly inexpensive. Uh, and in particular, if you're driving other uh, circuitry on your, uh, in your application, uh, the PMIC may be a perfect solution. Uh, so it just really depends on the application and how you, uh, how you want to configure this. Uh, I'd like to drill down a little bit more deeply into the whole power scheme because there's a lot of stuff going on the, in the chip that, um, that helps us with, uh, with managing power. So here's what we've seen up to now. We've seen the I.O. ring and we've seen the core and digital circuitry. Uh, we've seen the LDO. VDD can run from about 1.6 volts up to about 3.6 volts. So you have a fairly wide range of VDD options. Since the LDO is going to uh, produce no more than about 1.1 volts on its output, uh, 1.6 is, is plenty of, of input voltage for this, uh, for this product. Now, also on that, uh, that I.O. rail, we're going to include a supply voltage monitor. The purpose of this is to make sure that the voltage rails are, are within uh, specification and to reset the uh, core uh, if things fall too, too low. We have an always-on domain that, um, like it implies, it's always going to be turned on. Uh, that's primarily the uh, uh, real-time clock, uh, a uh, wake-up timer, and a power sequencer. Uh, we have a flash memory. Now, this switch for the flash memory doesn't actually power up the flash memory logic. That's for the charge pump associated with the flash, and most of the time that switch is open. The only time we close that switch is when we're programming the flash. So right now that 256K block of flash is floating, uh, but we'll hook it up in just a second. 
In addition to the LDO, we include a retention regulator. Now, this is a, a very low quiescent current regulator, and its job is to do nothing but just retain the core state and retain the state of the RAMs. Uh, you never run the product on the retention regulator. Managing the retention regulator happens automatically, so it's nothing you really need to worry about, but I wanted to make you aware uh, of, of the retention regulator because it is a feature that we have in this. We don't depend on the LDO to retain the, uh, the state of the core and the state of the RAM. The LDO generally produces about 1.1 volts. It's, it's manageable. The retention regulator always produces 0 0.9 volts, so it's not enough to run the, the core and everything at full speed, but it is enough to keep everything retained. Um, there, I hooked up the flash. So if you're running from flash, you'll close this switch and power up the flash uh, digital logic. Uh, you don't necessarily have to do that. You could certainly run from RAM. And speaking of, uh, of RAM, we have four blocks of RAM, two 16K blocks, two 32K blocks. Now that means you can turn on just the amount of RAM you need to use, and if you don't need to use all 96K of RAM, well, good on you. Uh, you can uh, turn on or off as much, uh, of the, as much of the RAM as you actually require. There's a 96 megahertz ring oscillator that we can turn on or off, and when we talk about clocking, you'll see why you might want to turn that off, in, in, and that comes up in just a moment. So that's the power scheme. Uh, there are three other pins that, we, uh, that, uh, that I'm going to keep for myself. Uh, two of those pins are for the real-time uh, clock oscillator. Uh, that's a standard tuning fork crystal, 32 kilohertz, and if you're not using the real-time clock, you don't have to connect a crystal. Just uh, connect the um, RTC, uh, RTCXI pin to ground and leave the RTXO pin open. The part will be perfectly happy, and it will free run on its 96 megahertz uh, ring oscillator. And then the final pin is the reset pin. Uh, and reset is an obvious thing, uh, so I won't belabor that. All the rest of the pins belong to you, and so we need to talk a little bit about GPIO. One thing you'll notice is I don't give these pins specific names. I don't call out peripherals. These are, this is just port 0 bit something. So port 0 bit 1, bit 2, bit 3. We don't really declare uh, any specialized function, and we'll show you why in just a minute. But before I get to the special functions, I want to describe how these things work with regard to the, uh, to the uh, GPIO function. Now, the whole purpose of GPIO is to connect a pin to the internal system logic through one mechanism or another, and to connect system logic out to a pin. So we have a buffer, uh, that drives the logic, and we have your standard totem pole output that drives the pin. We separately drive the P-channel and the in-channel uh, transistors, so you can, uh, you can turn one on, turn the other on, or turn them both off, and then you have just a pure input uh, and a floating pin. In addition, of course, we have interrupt logic that we will talk about more in just a, a moment. Um, we can tailor the drive strength for the, uh, for the output, and we can tailor the slew rate for the output as well. So if you don't need to drive a pin particularly fast, you can save uh, power and uh, certainly save um, uh, EMI concerns uh, by reducing the slew rate. So, uh, so we have those, uh, those abilities on the output. Uh, we also have separately enableable pull-up and pull-down resistors. So in a lot of cases, if, you, if you're trying to have um, an open drain bus, for example, you really don't need to have an external resistor. You can just turn on the pull-up resistor and, and you're all set up. If you need to bias the pin toward ground, you can turn on the pull-down resistor. So you have some options in terms of, uh, in terms of configuring the uh, outputs. Uh, you also have configurable input hysteresis. So uh, if you, if you want to add a Schmidt trigger action to the, uh, to the input, it's yours. 
Uh, let's talk about uh, interrupt logic a little bit. Interrupt logic is pretty much what you expect. Uh, you can do high level, low level, uh, rising edge and falling edge, and there's also a mode where you can interrupt on both edges if you want to. Upshot of all this is that uh, the, the GPIO is very, very flexible, and if you look at the uh, register layout for the GPIO, there are uh, about a dozen registers that manage each GPIO uh, port. In this case, you have one port with up to uh, up to 14 pins. So, um, but that but there are a lot of registers that manage the uh, GPIO. Now, I want to talk about the pin assignments and, and how we assign those things. Um, here is uh, here's the pin assignment map, and you can see in the GPIO column, I have that uh, line from port 0 bit 0 out to port 0 bit 13. Both packages have those pins, except only the TQFN gets 10 through 13, so that's just one you know, point that we need to um, you know, clarify a little bit there. Uh, any GPIO, you, know, you can configure them however you want, but each pin has one or more alternate functions. Uh, let's talk about UARTs. You have two UARTs. These are four-wire UARTs, so you get the transmit data, receive data, but you also get clear to send and request to send. Uh, these, these pins, these uh, modem control bits, uh, come out to pins, and they come into register bits, so you can, uh, you can set, clear, and read those, uh, those pins as you like. Now, since uh, UART1 is, uh, is only available as a four-wire UART in the TQFN package, we also give you the option of stealing the modem control signals from uh, UART0 and letting that be the transmit and receive for UART1. You can also put transmit and receive up on uh, port 0, bits 0 and 1. And I'll tell you why you might not want to in just a second. Um, I square C. We have uh, two I square C ports. Those are on fixed pins, uh, ports uh, uh, pins eight and nine, and pins uh, two and three. We have two uh, two spy ports. So you have uh, you have spy on uh, pins four through seven or on uh, ten through thirteen. You can also assign uh, spy port one uh, to pins zero through three, or port bit zero through three, if you like. Now, the reason you might not want to um, uh, you might not want to uh, assign uh, assign new functions to uh, bits zero and one is because that's where your single wire you know, debug lives by default. Uh, you can reassign that to uh, bits eight and nine. The problem with reassigning to bits eight and nine is as soon as you hit the reset, it goes back to zero and one. So from from a bare reset. Uh, you're always going to be on zero and one. Uh, you can debug on pins eight and nine, but only if your firmware uh, reassigns those pins. So one uh, minor limitation there. The, uh, the other two uh, things I haven't filled in are a 32K calibration output. So that's directly out of the real-time clock circuitry. And then there is a timer output. Uh, so you can do things like uh, pulse width modulation and uh, pulse trains uh, on the uh, timer output. Okay, so um, that's the uh, GPIO. Let's talk a little bit more about power, because, you know, who can't use more power these days? This is the slide you saw before. This is the standard uh, operating procedure where you p apply a battery to VDD, it drives the I.O. ring and an LDO. The LDO is turned on. It provides power to the core in digital. That includes the 96 megahertz uh, ring oscillator. And when everything's operating like this, we call that active mode. Uh, it's running, it's active, it's doing its thing, and it's draining as much power from the battery as it possibly can because in, in this mode, uh, everything is potentially turned on. Now, I will tell you that when you first turn on the, uh, the, the chip, as soon as it goes through the, uh, the C startup routines, 
it actually turns off all the peripherals. So once you're, you're out of the C startup routine, uh, this thing is actually running in a fairly low power mode, but it's still active mode, and, and you're still running the core at full speed. Fortunately, we do have other modes that we, can, that we can use. In active mode, everything's up and everything is clocked, unless the clocks are specifically disabled. There's also a sleep mode. Now, in sleep mode, the clocks are still turned on, but we've turned off the clock to the core. So the core is no longer running. The peripherals are active. The ring oscillator is still turned on. The RAMs are still turned on. And so specifically, if you have DMAs operating, uh, they're still running, but you've just turned off the clock to the core. When the, uh, when the signal comes for the core to wake up, it wakes up exactly where it left off. Uh, so this is sleep mode. Sleep mode is significantly lower power than active mode, but sometimes sleep mode just isn't enough. You need to deep sleep, and deep sleep mode turns off even more features. The core is now clocked off. Peripherals are still powered on, but the clock is removed from the peripherals. The RAM is still powered on, but clock is removed from the RAM, and in fact, we've turned off the high-speed clock. This gets you into a much lower power mode, but since you still have the LDO turned on and everything is, is, uh, is physically powered on, you're still s sipping some power. And that's the reason we also include a backup mode. Backup mode physically removes a lot of the power from the device. So the core is powered down. Peripherals are powered down. The clock is powered down. The RAM is still being retained from the retention regulator, but the core state, the peripheral state, and the, and the high-speed clock are, are turned off. This is the lowest power mode, and, and, and really you can get down to, to uh, microwatt uh, level in, uh, in backup mode. So the way you activate the power modes, active mode, that's default. You don't do a thing. Sleep mode, though, is easy to get into. You just use a, the wait for in, uh, interrupt instruction or the wait for event instruction. That configures sleep mode. It turns off the clock to the core and, and you're, you're sleeping. And it's very easy to come out of that. Um, deep sleep mode, you just set the deep sleep bit in the uh, system control register and then do the wait for interrupt or wait for event and, and you're good to go. Now here's the thing, the, the sleep mode and the deep sleep mode are ARM standard modes. Now how each chip vendor implements those modes is different. Um, but the uh, but but they're included. If you look in the ARM documentation, you'll find everything you need to know about wait for interrupt, wait for event, and and uh, deep sleep. But Maxim includes a mode that's kind of unique to us, and that's the backup mode. In the uh, power management register, in the uh, general control register set, there is a bit called mode. If you set that bit. Um, it will automatically and instantly enter backup mode that turns off all the, the power blocks and, and shuts the thing down. Now here's the thing, <clears throat> when you wake up from uh, backup mode, you're gonna go in through the reset vector because you've, you've lost state in the core. Sleep and deep sleep maintain the state of the core, so when you wake up, it's just like you awoke from an interrupt. How do you wake up out of uh, low power modes? Well, in sleep mode, it's any enabled interrupt. So, for example, if you, since, since the peripherals are still turned on, you can, uh, you can wake up from something like a, a uh, UART event or from a timer event, since all those things are, are potentially powered on. Deep sleep mode, though, since all those things are powered off, there are only a couple of things that can wake you. The real-time clock can wake you, or an external interrupt can wake you. Now, why an external interrupt? Well, because the external interrupt is not being, uh, doesn't require clock and it doesn't require power uh, from the LDO, it, it's powered from the, uh, from the pad ring and the pad ring is directly connected to VDD. So it, deep sleep mode can, uh, can be uh, exited by either the RTC or an external interrupt. Backup mode also depends on the RTC or an external interrupt, 
but the difference is you're going to wait through the reset vector. Okay, so that's that's power, and you see why I say you know you can you can really get in and out of these modes easily, uh, and uh, uh, so let's talk about clocks. Three clock sources. The first we've talked about is the 96 megahertz high speed clock. That's a ring oscillator that runs whenever it's enabled. There is a 32 kilohertz RTC clock that we talked briefly about, but one we haven't talked about is an 8 kilohertz nano power ring. Uh, this thing is running all the time. It's in our uh, it's in our always on domain. Um, so uh, let's talk about how we use these three clocks. The real-time clock is the only clock that's crystal controlled. The other clocks are free-running oscillators. And the real-time clock is immediately divided into a 32 kilohertz component and a divided by eight, four kilohertz component. The RTC actually runs on the four kilohertz clock, not the 32 kilohertz. But the 32 kilohertz clock is there so that the RTC can be trimmed. You can insert and remove clock edges uh, on the RTC to, to trim the clock. So you can calibrate the clock to an, external, um, uh, to an external reference. And that's the reason we give you the 32 kilohertz calibrated output. As you adjust the trim register to add and remove clock edges uh, from, the, uh, from the RTC divider chain, uh, you can perfect that clock. Uh, the nano oscillator really just drives the power sequencer. There is a power sequencer that's included, so anytime you apply battery, uh, the power sequencer pops right up and begins saying, okay, it's, we need to turn this block on, then that block on, then this next block. Now I can turn on the, the um, LDO, and I can begin enabling the various blocks connected to the digital chain. But the power sequencer is a critical piece of logic that doesn't answer to the core. Uh, it, uh, it kind of uh, dances to the beat of its own drummer. And then we mentioned the high-speed clock. Any of these clocks can be used as a clock source for the core. We have a, 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 a two to the end divider in front of the CPU, and the peripheral clock is always divided by two from the CPU clock. You can... Uh, programmatically select which input you want to use uh, for the uh, for the CPU and peripheral clock and then you can programmatically divide uh, set up the divider and uh, and so you can you can choose what you uh, what frequency you want to operate at now as a rule what we like to see folks do is is uh, follow the rule where you race as fast as you can to get to sleep so um, while you can run the CPU more slowly, and that's a perfectly valid uh, way to do things, it's um, uh, we we really love to see applications where where you you run as quickly as possible until you get to a stopping point, and then put the put the CPU to sleep until you're ready to do do the next thing. Um, all right, let's take a look at the take a look at the peripherals. We've seen what's inside. Uh, don't need to belabor this too much. There is a watchdog timer that we uh, that we haven't talked about. Um, everything else we've we've kind of talked about. Uh, two UARTs, as I mentioned before. Um, we have two spy ports. They're slightly different. One spy port includes an, an I2S uh, peripheral. There are two I2C ports. There are three timers, one of which exposes a, um, an output. And then there's the serial wire debug, which is the standard thing you, you get from ARM. Uh, very briefly, we'll talk a, a little bit about development tools. Um, this is the 32660 EVSYS. This is actually kind of a cool thing because it uh, it's the... Uh, the 32660 and the debug adapter all built onto one board. And so you have the evaluation system on the, uh, on the right, and then you have the debug adapter on the left. As long as these two boards are connected together, uh, they work kind of as a unit. You just plug a, a USB cable into the, into the uh, connector over on the left, 
and the uh, and the microcontroller on that left side begins acting as a, a CMSYS DAP compatible debug adapter. And you can send debug commands, loader, and there's even a, a uh, uh, there's even a console UART that gets exposed on that uh, on that uh, USB port. Over on the right, uh, that's the thing that you're managing. And so all the I.O. that you have <clears throat> on the 32660 is expressed on that mm, pin array uh, that you can plug down on a standard 10th-inch breadboard and begin, uh, begin doing whatever you want. As far as peripherals on that board, not much. You get a single push button, and you get uh, a red LED. Uh, but the whole idea is that if you want to uh, expand things, uh, put uh, sensors and actuators and things like that, you plug it down on a breadboard and begin building your application. Now, once you've gotten your application built, the cool thing is you can, uh, you can uh, build your application, then break this board in two. Right there in, in the middle, it's, uh, it's scored. And so you can break the thing in two and use a uh, just a standard CMSYS DAP adapter uh, with your uh, SWD uh, connector on on your target board, and um, and just solder this uh, this evaluation sys down on your board as a component. So if you're at a at a point where you're not quite ready to to commit to a big complicated layout that involves the uh, wafer level package or even the TQFN, you can drop this down in a dip socket. Uh, on your application board, uh, and uh, presumably your application board would have the uh, uh, SWD connector, and so now you're ready to you're ready to go. So uh, the evaluation uh, sys system is available now, and uh, uh, I've uh, uh, had a lot of uh, put a lot of miles on this myself, and I can uh, I can attest to you that it's a uh, good, solid, reliable uh, kit. Um, now, with regard to uh, with regard to software. Uh, if you are prototyping, Embed is a dynamite system. You're probably all familiar with Arduino as well. Um, the Embed system is something that's directly supported by by ARM, and uh, we're uh, you know we're pretty pumped about uh, Embed as a uh, as a system. Uh, we're also pretty pumped about Eclipse because Eclipse is a set of free tools, and we have a uh, a complete Eclipse based IDE with a GCC development uh, tool chain uh, that's available for download from our website. So if you, um, if you have any interest, I, I encourage you to jump over to our website, uh, grab the, um, the Eclipse package, and uh, you'll be up and running in, in no time. The thing that Eclipse has over Embed is that Eclipse has a uh, complete uh, GDB-based debugger. With Embed, uh, debugging uh, can be a bit of a challenge. So... Uh, uh, you're, you're pretty much limited to, to uh, just printf debug on, on embed. Eclipse, you can set breakpoints, run to breakpoints, single step, do the whole, the whole shoot and match with, uh, with Eclipse. Um, we also support the professional tools from IAR, from Kyle, and from Rally Associates. Uh, all these guys uh, fully support our, uh, our microcontrollers on ARM, and everything you see here is CMSYS compliant. So uh, that's the, uh, uh, you know, that's ARM's uh, Cortex software interface standard. We, uh, and yeah, everything you see here is, um, is compatible with that. So to summarize, um, before we uh, get up to your questions, I just want to tell you what I've told you. Um, what you have here is an ARM Cortex M4 with a floating point unit and DSP extensions. In the smallest package in the industry, as far as we know, I, I think this is about the, the tiniest uh, Cortex-M4 out there, uh, with the lowest power and a rich peripheral set that's really very affordable. And so uh, that's the uh, MAX32660. And uh, now I'd like to open the floor to questions. Uh, if, if I can't answer them, uh, Chris certainly can. Thank you. Now we'll jump right into our Q&A session. If you would like to submit a question, type your question into the question window on the side of your screen and hit the submit button. While we're answering questions, please complete the feedback form located on the bottom of your screen. So here's our first question. 
can you run the high speed clock at a frequency lower than 96 megahertz? Uh, that's a good question, and uh, the answer is that the, the high-speed clock itself is fixed at 96 megahertz. That's baked into the silicon. Now, what you can do is is immediately out of the oscillator, you can divide the, the clock by any power of 2 up to uh, 128. So you can you can certainly divide the clock and present a lower-speed clock to the rest of the logic, but the clock itself is still running at 96 megahertz. Since it's a very low power oscillator, I'm not too concerned about, um, about power draw out of the oscillator itself. It's really once you get down into the, uh, into the logic that you begin, um, that you begin getting, getting power concerns. So, uh, so the specific answer is no, it runs at 96, but you can immediately divide that by a factor of, um, uh, by a power of two factor. Okay, here's another question. What does the MCU offer in terms of security? The MAX 32660 doesn't include a security block, and that's really not its, its, its purpose. If there's ever a microcontroller that's a, uh, something of a logic replacement product, it's a 32660. Um, we have a lot of microcontrollers that do include security features. And, uh, and and that's something uh, you ought to take a look at because I'm uh, I'm very pumped about uh, Maxim's commitment to security, but that's not the product the 660 is. If you if you do need security, uh, we have some small microcontrollers that include security features. Ben, if I can add one more comment on that, that everything Ben said is true there. <clears throat> we do have a, a a flavor of this that'll be coming out soon that has a secure bootloader baked into the flash uh, when it's shipped to you. Uh, it, it, the crypto is implemented in, in software, though. There's no hardware acceleration for it. But the intent is so that we could ship you something that then you could securely load your uh, firmware onto. That's a, that's a coming soon product. Okay, here's the next question. Is there an ID in the chip? I don't believe so, Chris. Is there a, a un, there's no unique ID lasered into this, right? Uh, actually, it, not, yeah. Let me take that because uh, the uh, it, it let everybody in on, on the dirty secret of the silicon industry. We don't always get it right on the first revision. Um, <clears throat> there is one in the first chip, first revision of the chip. It's just unreadable, which uh, makes it a little bit less than useful. The uh, in the second revision of the chip, which is actually coming out very soon, by the time anybody here could probably get their hands on kits, will probably be in those. Uh, does have a 64-bit unique uh, programmed ID. Okay, here's another question. Can you explain more about how GPIO pin assignments can be mixed and matched? For example. One I squared C, one U R, and the rest as G P I O. Yeah, that's uh, actually pretty straightforward. Uh, when you uh, uh, and and I'm, I'm going to encourage you once again, go download the the uh, the development kit because all of the uh, definition files are included with that, and it is it is enlightening to to read those, and and they're pretty much full of. Uh, uh, doxygen comments. So uh, a lot of our a lot of our documentation is is taken directly from the the source files. But to to but to answer the question, uh, every uh, every bit of each GPIO port is uh, is supported by multiple configuration bits. Uh, two of those configuration bits are a, an alternate function one, uh, alternate function zero. And so if you, if you set alternate function uh, 0 and 1 to any one of the, the four states, you're selecting either GPIO or one of the three alternate functions. Uh, since that's assignable uh, on a bit-by-bit uh, -bit -bit basis, uh, you can actually do really dumb things like setting your... your uh, uh, UART, setting the transmit pin of the UART to transmit pin, but the receive pin to GPIO. Now, you know, I don't frankly recommend that you do that. I've never done that, and 
our APIs don't support that, but if you if you elected to go be, uh, around our APIs and set those bits, well, um, best of luck to you. <laughs> That's, but you could certainly do that, and, and every pin of every uh, port bit has these two bits that, uh, that set the alternate function. Uh, does that answer the question? Okay. Um, I think so. Uh, here's the next question. Is a radiation hardened variant available? Uh, Chris, I don't think there is. Is there? No, no, we haven't done anything specifically for radiation hardening with uh, with our micros. Uh, we have another question. Someone simply wrote, "Why no ADC?" Uh, actually, that's a that's a good question, um, and and it kind of goes to uh, it kind of goes to to it's a philosophical question in a sense. The idea here is that is that um, we're trying to get to a very small part, and any time you begin including uh, uh, including analog circuitry uh, on a part, that's going to take some silicon. That honestly, we didn't want to we didn't want to build that in to this part. We have parts with built-in uh, ADCs. Um, one of the trends that we're seeing is that a lot of sensors are uh, building the ADCs directly into the sensor. Rather than rather than expose an analog signal, and that makes frankly a lot more sense than bringing uh, a very low level analog signal around a noisy circuit board to an ADC input. Um, I'd really rather the silicon vendor take care of the the ADC and the noise issues and all that, rather than uh, rather than leave that to um, the board designer. And, uh, and and so that's the reason we, we tout this as being a sensor concentrator. Our, the idea here is that the sensor is going to have its own ADC. Uh, Maxim builds uh, a lot of um, a lot of sensor products with ADC, and when you look at things like accelerometers and that that sort of thing, all these things have uh, have digital uh, digital outputs, uh, usually either SPI or, or I2C. So that's you know that that's kind of a convoluted answer, but the idea is that that's the, the correct answer is that's really not what this part is. The, this, this part is really designed to to be more of a a digital hub. Okay, here's the next question: Does Maxim have a Bluetooth low energy transceiver IC that pairs well with the 32660, or are there plans to integrate a Bluetooth low energy transceiver? With the 32660 die as a new product. Chris, you want to yeah, take that I'll one? Take, yeah, I'll take that one. Uh, Maxim does not have a standalone Bluetooth transceiver chip. Uh, we do have um, micros with Bluetooth uh, integrated into a single SOC um, coming out very soon. Okay, next question. How is the flash memory programmed? Um, well, you got a couple of options. Uh, if you use the uh, CMSYS DAP uh, interface adapter, one of the things that's exposed over the SWD is the is the flash controller, and so you simply uh, you simply use SWD commands to to go in and, and access the flash controller and, and program the flash. Uh, we, prog we have flash programming software built into our development kits, uh, and with the um, with the uh, adapter that's on the uh, 32660 EV Sys, uh, when you plug that into your PC, it just looks like a disk drive, and you drag and drop a binary file to your disk drive, and it programs it. So it's very very simple. Second answer is that the flash controller exposes its registers to the to the program. So if you've got a program running in flash and you want to access uh, another part of the flash, you can uh, you can uh, programmatically uh, drop the flash controller and access the uh, access the the uh, programming logic. So if if you want to program it in your from your program, that's possible. If you if you're talking about programming for um, just for for initial program loading, uh, we have you covered there. 
Okay, here's another question. Is there any functional difference between the WLP and the TQFN besides the package? Uh, no. Uh, with one caveat, then, the, the, uh, the uh, TQFN exposes a few extra pins, but other than that, correct. That's right. Okay, here's another question. Someone has a question concerning the accuracy of the nano RC oscillator. Um, the uh, the eight kilohertz oscillator. All these oscillators are are trimmed at the factory, um, but uh, but every RC oscillator that you that you implement in silicon is going to have a uh, is is going to have a drift with temperature and voltage, and so I'm I'm not willing to say that. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not willing to. I wouldn't set my watch by that by that oscillator. Um, I don't have a specific accuracy number. Um, I, I'm I'm sure that's something that is tested, but I don't I don't have that at hand. Okay, here's another question: Why are the IT I2C pins fixed? Is there a way to assign I to C to another set of pins. Yeah, the reason the reason those pins are fixed is because the um, the actual structure of the of the I/O pad is slightly different for I square C. Uh, I square C is designed to be an open drain uh, an open drain bus, and so if you look on the um, if you look on the uh, data sheet for this part, you'll see that the I square C pins have a slightly different. Um, uh, sync current capability than the other pins, and the whole idea there is when you pull down on the I square C pin, you want it to go down in a hurry. And so the the, the pad structure is slightly different for pins that are I square C capable than the other pins, and that's the reason we don't make those make those pins assignable. Okay, another question: What firmware update tools are available? Um, that's kind of up to you uh, because because we don't specifically uh, uh, we we don't provide a, a, a specific bootloader for this uh, for this product or a a remote update loader so that's kind of a uh, an application uh, uh, an application question uh, if you if you want to do uh, remote updates or in system updates uh, that's a capability you're going to have to provide. But just to add on to that, Ben, I, I mentioned earlier a, a variant of this that would come pre-programmed with the bootloader. That would actually provide some capability of in-application programming. Um, since the, we don't have any kind of communication interface, like a, a wireless or something like that on this, you would have to figure out how to get the data there to the first place, but we'll certainly publish the, an API to, to help people with that, that update process. Here's another question. Is there a minimum clock rate for the part? Um, no, the part is static. So the, the good news is you can pretty much run this thing down as, as low as you want. And uh, practically, the, uh, the minimum frequency is going to be the 8 kilohertz, um, 8 kilohertz nano ring uh, divided by 128. So that's pretty stinking slow. Um, but as as far as you know, can the part uh, is is there a minimum frequency? Since you can make this part static, uh, when when you execute the wait for interrupt instruction, you've effectively taken the clock frequency of the core to zero. So the answer is no. There's there's no minimum clock speed. Well, that concludes today's presentation. On behalf of Electronic Design, I'd like to thank DigiKey and Maxim Integrated for sponsoring today's event, and of course, all of you for joining. Have a great rest of the day.